Thank you very much. Um, this evening I'm going to talk to you about why coral reefs are threatened by a changing climate. I spend my life underwater when I can in places <clears throat> like this, these atolls. And coral reefs like these are increasingly rare, they're full of life, but one thing is very important and that is that we're losing them. And it's the actions of you that will determine whether these survive or not. So I want to convince you tonight that you will care about these places. Charles Darwin not only wrote The Origin of Species, he wrote on the structure and distribution of coral reefs. This book, my copy, was published back in 1874 and it was based on observations <coughs> that Charles Darwin made on his voyage on the Beagle as it came on its homeward journey from the South Pacific, past islands like Tahiti, through the Great Barrier Reef, and then across the Indian Ocean, past coral atolls to the island of Mauritius. And he also looked at many of the statements from mariners, one being Captain Moresby, who was important for his, some of his discoveries of the places we're going to visit this evening. <clears throat> now in Darwin's book, <coughs> he describes his subsidence theory of coral reef formation. And he developed this, this theory from his observation. He realised that volcanic islands like this would have coral reefs growing around them, but these islands over geological time, many millions of years, subsided. And as they subsided, the coral reef grew up to stay within the light, <coughs> And that coral reef ended up becoming a ring of coral like this, with palm trees and sometimes sandy islands on it. And he elegantly showed his theory in these woodcuts illustrated here, where we can see the coral reef the side here. This volcanic island would gradually subside, and the coral reef would grow up through towards the light, offshore becoming a barrier reef and eventually forming this ring of coral. And in fact his theory was proven a long time after his death, death in the 1950s when after nuclear testing they drilled down through Bikini Atoll in the <coughs> South Pacific and they went down 1,200 metres still going through coral, proving that the coral had grown upwards and in the end, they struck volcanic rock underneath. What Darwin didn't know, and could not know, is despite the growing industrial revolution that was going on around him, the climate was going to warm. He died at the start of this graph here. But what this graph shows is that in recent decades, we've had warm years. These are warmer than average years compared to these years back here. Now, I want to tell you a bit more about coral reefs. They're productive and they are diverse. They're actually made up of animals. They're living <coughs> animals that create a calcium carbonate skeleton. <coughs> they produce some six grams of carbon per meter squared per day compared to many other forms of, of life, that's a lot. They lay down 10 kilograms of calcium carbonate per meter squared per year. That's similar to 10 bags of sugar piled up, just to give you some idea of what that means. And they accrete up to seven meters in a thousand years. And they're full of life. This is microhabitat, it's an enemy for the <coughs> clownfish that are protected by that sea anemone, for instance. Here we have an apex predator, a shark, patrolling along the edge of the reef, looking for fish to feed on that are often hiding amongst the corals and sea fans. We have turtles. This is a green turtle that feeds on algae and seagrass that grows in between the corals. There are also hawksbill turtles that eat sponges. Then we have these big sponges here that 
bore into the roof structure. And in amongst all these nooks and crannies, we have fabulous species like this octopus here that use those spaces to hide away in an ambush uh, to feed, as other things come past. <coughs> now millions, 500 million people, depend on the resources derived from reefs. The global annual service value of reefs to mankind is around $10 million a year, or 352,000 US dollars per hectare per year, and some estimates go much higher, up to 375 billion US dollars per year. So coral reefs are really valuable to human life. <coughs> their greatest value, their greatest service value, is in the protection of coasts, 45% of their value. All those millions and billions of dollars is in coastal protection preventing flooding. And 50% comes from tourism and recreation, particularly as foreign exchange earned for, by those developing countries that often have the coral reefs. But over 60% of reefs are now threatened. They're threatened <coughs> by local human activity. Examples being overfishing or destructive fishing that breaks up the coral reef. Land runoff with nutrients and fertilizers that run off into the reef, and reefs rely on being in a low nutrient environment. And also by all sorts of coastal development projects that produce sediment that tends to destroy the reef. And climate change is now having a big effect as well. Last month in September, the International Panel on Climate Change produced a special report which indicated that sea temperatures, the rate of sea temperature change, has doubled since 1993. And as we'll see, this is going to cause corals to bleach. Sea level is estimated to rise by over a metre by the end of this century. We're going to get more frequent storms and flooding, particularly in tropical locations. And the oceans are going to acidify. They're going to become more acidic. And corals build reefs out of calcium carbonate, limestone. So they're particularly subject to acids which will dissolve them away. Now the key to this prodigious productivity in coral reefs is actually something very tiny. It's symbiotic algae. These algae live in a mutually beneficial relationship inside <coughs> the cells of the coral. There's a million of them per square centimetre of coral tissue. And they work hard. This is my garden at home. It's very green. It's full of leaves that are photosynthesizing. And there are multi-layers of those <coughs> with species that can work in low light, deeper down at the bottom of the, the hedges and so forth. But this is coral. This is coral tissue and it's full of these algae that can photosynthesize. But they're an order of magnitude better than leaves. And that's because they've been in symbiosis for 250 million years in a very stable environment inside the cells of the corals. And what's more, the coral skeletons play a really important role in reflecting that light to optimize the light that these algae use. This is a laser pointer pointed at a black background. It doesn't really do anything. If we point that laser pointer at a coral, it will light up like a light bulb. And that's because the coral skeleton is beautifully adapted to reflect the light. So all of those algae, however deep within the tissues, are creating energy. They're the powerhouse of the coral reef. And corals can regulate their algae seasonally. We did a study out in Mauritius. It took six years. We went to this same coral every week and took a sample of the tissue and counted the algae within it. Now in Mauritius, it's in the southern hemisphere, so its summer is in our winter, so in January and February, the algal numbers are very low, because there's lots of light. In the winter, the algal numbers are very high. So what the coral is doing is it's regulating these algae, it's regulating essentially its energy source. 
And this was the first time that this had really been identified in a long-term study. But too much light, which occurs during warm and still conditions, causes corals to expel their algae. The algae are working too well. They're producing too much oxygen, which becomes toxic to the animal cells. So what do these <coughs> animals do? It used to be a mutually beneficial relationship, but in this situation, those algae are dangerous. This is parasitism almost now. So the coral gets rid of those algae. It expels <coughs> them in a last ditch to survive. So what we see are the corals turning white because we're seeing the skeletons now reflecting. And the coral will die if these conditions persist. With some stress, up to say 10 weeks or so, the corals will still survive, they might recover. But after three months, almost certainly the coral will die, it will start to get covered with filamentous algae. Then bioeroders like sponges and calcareous algae will break down that coral and become <coughs> a bone yard. Basically, that rubble will be swept off the reef. And that is really the end of the reef. Now, in order to study climate change like this, we've got to go to a remote, uninhabited place where there are none of those local human impacts. <coughs> And we go out to the British Indian Ocean Territory, a very remote part of the world, out here. It is a British territory, this is its coat of arms called Turtles Rampant, as you can see. And they are around Chagos. The reefs are called the Chagos Archipelago. This area was one of the world's largest marine protected areas until 2016, when the bigger American <coughs> started to take over. But Britain has now produced even bigger ones in the, um, in the Arctic region, um, in the Antarctic region, sorry. So we're, we're building bigger reserves now. But what this graphic shows <coughs> is an area of coral reefs on top of the submarine mountains and volcanoes. Here we can see one of the biggest coral reefs just here. <coughs> and we need a platform to get there, we need a big ship, and this provides a diving <coughs> platform so we can go underwater and investigate this area. Now here we can see the, the Great Chagos Bank, one of the largest atolls in the world, one that Darwin investigated, and we can also note that only the lightest areas are actually above sea level. Most of these reefs are underwater. <coughs> now, these are beautiful places. <coughs> They're full of life, but no human impact. But, reef water, uh, water, sea water warming has affected these reefs, and we had two major warming events in 2015 and 2016, shown by these stress level charts here, when the water was very warm between May and July. Temperatures got over 30 degrees Celsius, that's more than one degree above the normal temperature at which these corals would tolerate at the highest um, temperatures of the year. And these corals, even in this remote location, bleached. They became <coughs> white, they lost their algae, they died, they became eroded, they washed down the reef front and took new um, corals that had settled on them down into deep water where they would not survive. And we've looked at the changes to these reefs, and this graphic <coughs> illustrates what we've seen. We've seen different life forms like microalgae, coral, li live hard coral, dead <coughs> corals, and sponges. And as we move to this side of the graph, we go deeper underwater, and the red points on this graph show. Um, post-bleaching in 2019, whereas the reef was recently intact back in 2014, which are the blue squares. And we see that algae has increased, particularly in deeper water, since these warming events. Coral has decreased greatly. Dead coral has been washed off the reefs, it started to go, <coughs> but sponges have increased because they're eroding these reefs away. And working with, with colleagues, um, 
One colleague, Chris Perry at Exeter University, has calculated that the coral <coughs> carbonate production on these reefs has declined by 77%. Another colleague, Daniel Bailey from UCL, who works with us, has shown that the, 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 these corals have lost structure and um, roughness, essentially. And they've reduced their growth from 10 millimetres per year almost to negative values. So these corals are now in a weakened state. These atoll reefs will erode. They may not compete um, to keep pace with subsidence and sea level rise as per Darwin's subsidence theory. And this is a model built from lots and lots of photographs and a created three-dimensionally to show a coral reef in this erosional state. And what you can begin to see is there are flat areas on this reef. Only the yellowy colours are living coral now. All the other grey, white areas are dead coral. You see this is now all flattened, not much is growing. That's a quadrat giving a metre square scale. Um, but we can see here this is now an eroded, failing degrading reef. And this is what is happening out there to these wonderful places. And this means that the environment for those other species, the habitats for those other species, is disappearing. Now some corals survive. <coughs> this one here is probably over 400 years old. It's over four metres across. It's bleached but recovered. It's a resilient coral. This one is endemic to the Chagos Archipelago. It pretty much died off, but it's a relic. It's managed to recover slightly. <coughs> Others survive because they're in deep water. Others are resistant, perhaps because they've got a different form of these algae living inside them. And others <coughs> recruit, only successfully if those recruits can land on consolidated substrate that isn't rubble and moving around. But can these corals build reefs? What will happen in the next bleaching event, which we expect to happen in the next few years? So I'd like to conclude by saying that the remaining shallow coral reef communities will differ in their species composition and diversity from the reefs we've seen to date. These wonderful environments where these big grouper are are going to be lost. We're going to see declines in coral reef health which will greatly diminish the service value to society, food provision, coastal protection, and tourism. And even if the global community could manage to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, which is the ambitious aim of the Paris Climate Agreement, it would mean the extinction of 17 up to 90 percent of all reefs. And if we go with what the world's politicians are agreeing <coughs> with at the moment, which is the 2% rise in temperature, then that means 99% of coral reefs will be lost. They'll essentially be doomed. So my take-home message to you is that coral reef ecosystems are at grave risk. The severity of recent warming events on remote reefs, never mind those that are affected by humans just locally, on these remote coral reefs, is warning us of the urgent need to strengthen the global response to climate change. We've got to reach and sustain net zero global carbon dioxide emissions. And that is the responsibility of all of us. If we can't achieve that <coughs> by 2050, certainly by the end of this century, but as early as possible, then these environments are going to be lost. And these are going to be one of those first ecosystems to become extinct because of our actions. So I'd like you just to take home that message. Thank you very much.